Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and to him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Please be seated. It's like uh, Clapham Junction and Russia up here. You don't know what that means, do you? But anyway, it's like Grand Central and Russia up here. Does that communicate? Okay. Um, turn with me to your Bibles. Since you're doing that, perhaps we could thank uh, the musicians for their work for us this morning at the end of a long day. And so if you turn to the book of Romans, no, no. Genesis, Genesis chapter 12. Now, for those of you who were longing that I would get into um, all the controversy that seems to be around Genesis chapters 1 and 2, I am not starting in Genesis 1 and 2. And this is not because I haven't preached on these passages uh, several times, and indeed at least once at College Church. And if you want to know what I think about those things, feel free to check it out online. But we're beginning at Genesis chapter 12, okay? So let's uh, pray as we uh, start to study God's word together. Lord, would you please, we ask, help us to discern wondrous things in your law, in your word. Uh, would it be the case this morning that your word would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path? Thank you, Lord, that you say that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, and so we ask that your Spirit would do what we cannot do. But we come before you in expectancy. The next few moments would not simply be an exercise in understanding Abraham and the call of Abraham and all the rest, but actually a message from you for us all, for me, uh, for us as a church, for us as individuals, uh, for you if this is your first time you've been to church or ever been to church. And so we pray, Lord, that you would do this, that you would honor your word. Uh, you have promised that your word will not return to you empty, but accomplish that which you have designed for it to do. And so we ask that you would keep that promise this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so, friends, we're in Genesis chapter 12. I want you to look down at the text. We had it read out so very well. And as you look down together, I want you to hear parts of it again. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I'll show you. That's the first part of the structure of this passage, the call of Abram. And then in verses uh, two and three is this wonderful announcement of blessing. Let's just camp there for a moment. It is easy, isn't it, to think that if we truly commit our lives to Christ, if, uh, like Abraham, we leave behind a life, uh, in his case, of pagan idolatry from his household, and in our case, uh, commit ourselves to Christ in a new and fresh way, if we do that, we will miss out. We'll miss out on fun, we'll miss out on um, intellectual rigor, 
It will not be a life of blessing, but I want to camp here just for a moment before we move on as I explain the structure and then we'll take each of these parts one by one. I want at the beginning for you to understand that what this passage is doing is announcing the great truth that the devil in uh, Genesis um, earlier, Genesis chapter three, had denied. And that is that to obey God and to follow God is good for you. No, the devil came to Eve and said, actually, God is just a spoil sport. That's why he doesn't want you to uh, eat uh, from uh, this tree in the middle of the garden. Uh, He doesn't want you to do that. In fact, he doesn't want you to touch that, though God did not say that. And so the devil puts around a whole prescription of legalistic understandings, what it means to follow God. And here God comes in the beginning of this new beginning, Genesis chapter 12, to announce to Abraham through his word, he speaks... Every new movement of God, every new beginning of God begins with God speaking. He speaks, and what he speaks is blessing. So the really hard work we have to do this morning is not so much to understand this text or the Hebrew behind it or the structure of it. The really hard work we have to do this morning is to believe that it is true that when God says, go, Follow me, give your life to me in every possible way. That is indeed good. It is good for us. It is the life of fulfillment and indeed, yes, blessing. And so these verses, which are very much the foundational verses for the gospel throughout the Bible, come to counter the lie of the devil from the beginning that actually following God is bad for you. It's bad for you intellectually. You've got to be a simple-minded sort of ignoramus to believe that the Bible is uh, still in any way reliable. It's bad for you intellectually. It's bad for you morally. Those Christians are just narrow-minded about various sexual um, morality issues today. Really, it's freedom to break those boundaries. It's bad for you socially. You won't be able to get a good job. It's bad for you in any number of different ways. That's the lie that we all hear repeated over and over again in our minds from the evil one and from the culture around. The hard work we have to do this morning is to believe that it is actually the case that to center our lives upon God, to commit our life to God, is indeed good. It is good for us. Now, this blessing that uh, is announced is certainly not a prosperity gospel blessing. It is certainly not, you know, you'll get a BMW in three seconds flat if you just follow the following rules. Anyone who thinks that the blessing of the Old Testament announced to Abraham is a prosperity gospel blessing has not examined very closely the life of Abraham. For he wandered through this land and never physically inherited the land that he had been promised. No, it is not that kind of blessing, but it is nonetheless a profound blessing. And we need to do the hard work of believing that and understanding what that blessing is. Well then, in the end of the passage from verse four to the end is Abraham's obedience, and in particular, his worship. He builds an altar. So that's where we're going. Now I want to set some of the context this morning from the beginning of Genesis. I've already done some of that. I said at the last two services that in some ways, if you think of your Bible in two halves, there's an Old Testament and the New Testament, right? And in the middle of those two, there's a blank piece of paper that divides the Old and the New Testament in some ways. Though obviously there are reasons why that piece of paper is there because Matthew's gospel begins with you know, the, the, the story of Christ and all the rest. So we understand why that is there. But in some ways, really, we should take that piece of paper out between the Old and the New Testament and insert it, well, where should we insert it? Maybe at Genesis chapter three, for we do not live in a world which is all good anymore. We live in this new reality of a fallen world which God steps in to rescue us and provide blessing, but all around in this pilgrimage that we are on, that Abraham was on, that we're on in our own lives, we are walking through this land with dangers and difficulties externally and internally in our psychology and our genetic code. There's all sorts of fallenness. And so the real distinction in the Bible is between Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 and the rest. Could say that. Well, we could say the real difference is between Genesis 
chapter 11 and Genesis chapter 12. For in some ways, the book of Genesis is divided as following. Genesis 1 through to 11, God's creation, and then the creation rebelling against God. Genesis 12 to the end, God's new movement. He speaks a word and calls Abraham and gathers a people and a blessing around this new movement, and then will go to all nations. And that is basically the message of Genesis. So we come to this very important part of the Bible. As I say, it is a command, a blessing, and then action. Let's look at the command, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. What a remarkable thing to be told to do. In a rather smaller way, Rochelle and I, when we were coming to America many years ago and were asked by a church to pastor the church, you guys don't know all this story, but it was a church of 20 people with a long history of conflict in a rented Seventh-day Adventist building. None of the people had we met, and they had just about enough money to pay us for one year. It was a real deal. But we sense, and there were other opportunities we could have taken if we felt that God was calling us, but we sense that God was calling us. And we flew out to New Haven with a laptop, a printer, three suitcases, and nowhere to stay. I think we moved 10 or 15 times in that first year in America. We were absolutely culturally clueless. You may think we still are. (laughs) But we flew out at Thanksgiving, which apparently is a big deal around here. (laughs) And, uh, you know, the poor members of this church had to scramble to find a place for us to stay and, you know, trying to be very polite and nice to this ignorant British person. It seemed the most unlikely thing to do. And I'm not saying the meaning of this text means that you need to fly across the Atlantic to be a missionary. And I'm not saying the meaning of this text means that you must sell your house and go and live somewhere else. But I am saying that in the same way that Abraham was called to leave from the country of Haran, where his father had settled down and had been told to go to Canaan, but actually had not gone, and had settled in Haran and had probably uh, indulged in pagan idolatry of various kinds, And then God comes to Abraham and says, now it's your turn. Break the pattern. No longer be a place of pagan idolatry. No longer be a person of pagan idolatry. The Lord is speaking. Go. I have a promised blessing for you. We don't really have the time to do it, but I could make the case, I think, that every new movement of God, every new beginning of God begins in exactly this way, with God speaking, shedding light through his word, what happened at the Reformation that we're celebrating this 500th anniversary year. That's why we've got this one night centered on God on March the 17th. Sola Scriptura. We're remembering that the new movement of God that began then and has not yet finished, the word of God that is going out began in a similar way when the Lord said something. This, of course, is why as a church we study the Bible and work hard at it because we want to hear what God is saying to us. It is the most remarkable command. The book of Hebrews interprets it this way. It says that Abraham obeyed this command by faith. Abraham was not a perfect man, as you perhaps will know and as we will discover. He made many mistakes, but he was a faithful man. He took God at his word By faith, Abraham obeyed this command to go, even though, the book of Hebrews says, he went out not knowing where he was going. What an extraordinary thing to do. And I think it's a pattern of the life of faith as we are pilgrims in this world. Let me put it like this and ask you a series of succeeding questions that I think will make the point clear. What would it be like for you today if you decide to leave sin and cleave to Christ, that is, become a Christian? What will happen? What will the land be like?
What would it be like for you if you decide to break that sinful habit and pursue purity? That is, you're no longer saying, um, I'm struggling with this sin. Code for, I'm not really taking it very seriously. But I'm going to do whatever it takes to cut that off my life. And of course, I am a sinner, and Abraham is a sinner, and there will be times that I'll fail. But I'm leaving, and I'm going with Christ. What will the land be like if uh, you take that step this morning in obedience to God's command? What would it be like for you to decide to um, take the Bible as completely true and that the historical criticisms of the Bible are not valid? What will happen to you in your academic career if you do the same as Billy Graham did those many years ago? Go out into a wood, find a tree stump, put the Bible on the tree stump and say to God, I am going to take you at your word. There are many things I don't understand but I'm going to trust your word. What will happen to your academic career? What would it be like if you decide to move beyond mere nominal allegiance to Christ to radical trust and obedience to Christ's commands? And that, in a sense, I suppose, is the same thing as the first question, that is, become a real Christian. Well, I can tell you that it will be good. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you as well. I can tell you it'll be good. I can tell you it'll be blessing. But can I tell you who you will marry if you break off that engagement with a non-Christian? Can I tell you how God will provide if you break off um, cutting corners in business? Can I tell you how God will give to you what you need to provide for your family if you give your life to serve him in every area? Can I answer those questions? No, I cannot. Only God knows. Abraham knew not the land, but he still went. There's a rather wonderful story of a preacher back in the time of uh, Mary, Queen of England. And those of you who know your British history might realize that Mary, Queen of England, had a tendency to kill Protestant preachers, gospel preachers. And this man was well known for saying, everything works out for the best if you follow God. He was uh, arrested. Mr. Gilpin was his name. He was arrested, he was taken off to London to be killed, and uh, he was much mocked by those uh, soldiers for following the Bible and following Jesus and for saying everything works out for the best in the end for those who follow God. As he was riding along, he fell off his horse and broke his leg, and then they made great mockery of his statement. (laughs) Everything works out for the best. Not only are you going to be executed, you broke your leg beforehand. Well, because he broke his leg, they had to take a little longer to get into London, and by the time he got to London, Mary, Queen of Scots, was dead, and there was a new queen. (laughs) And Mr. Gilpin was right. But it does take faith, doesn't it? Faith in particular in the blessing. This is verses 2 and 3. Now these words are really the foundational stone for the gospel. I'll make you into a great nation, I'll bless you. Look at the wonderful blessing that God announces here. It is generous, great nation. It is personal, I'll bless you. He knows Abraham, I'll make your name great. It is multiple, you will be a blessing to others. It multiplies this blessing. It is protective. I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. It is international. All families, 
all peoples on earth blessed through the covenant blessing to Abraham. It is conditional through you, a great scandal of the gospel in many ways. This covenant is conditional through Abraham, fulfilled in Christ. It is conditional. And it is specific to your seed, to your offspring, um, which Paul in Galatians interprets as Christ, I think. What does it mean to be blessed by God? To be blessed by God is God's declaration of this being the right life. So this blessing that was announced to Abraham is picked up by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. You remember what he says? Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you will be fulfilled. Filled. Blessed are you the meek, for you will inherit the earth. This paradoxical, counterintuitive blessing is a pronouncement on Christ's part, and here on God's part, that this is the right life, that this is the life that may have times where it doesn't feel like it's blessed, where it doesn't seem like it's blessed, where Abraham goes to this land and there's still the Canaanites there, and it is certainly not, therefore, a prosperity gospel blessing. But it is a pronouncement that this is indeed the life that will be and is the right life the good life. In a sense, blessing is the Christian version of when you say someone's lucky. Well, there's no luck because God is sovereign over all and God blesses his people. They don't deserve it, it's a gift. Well, I want us just to dwell and soak in this blessing. I want you to realize that God is offering you this morning a foundational, beautiful blessing, that to center your life upon God is not bad for you. It is good for you. And then we come to the response. Verse four. So Abraham left. As the Lord had told him, a lot went with him. Abraham was, wait for it, 18 and full of vigor. <laughs> Abraham had been to the best schools and knew exactly what he was doing and had been well trained for this next step in missionary adventure. Abraham was 75 years old. Now, I don't know what you make of some of these rather lengthy years in the Old Testament. Someone just joked with me that Bible years are like dog years, they go on forever, but... But it's very clear in the text, when we get later when he's promised a son, that the advanced age of Abraham is intended to be something to strike us. And maybe you are 75, maybe you are older than 75, maybe you resonate with the person who said, I feel so old these days that I think they have discontinued my blood type. It's a wonderful missionary um, our family got to know in England. We, I grew up going to Anglican Church, a Bible teaching Anglican Church, just outside of London. And our family would drive, my father was a school teacher, and we'd drive from uh, the boarding school where he taught to the church every Sunday morning. And the missionary, who by then was in his 80s, uh, would uh, be walking along the road. And every Sunday, we'd offer to give him a lift, and every Sunday he would refuse, because he was walking, and he didn't want a ride. And eventually we had him back home for lunch and got to know him. And what we discovered was this person had been a missionary in China. And according to him, after he'd been kicked out of China, his most fruitful ministry in his whole life was when he was in his 70s ministering to the youth group. You may feel like it's your 11th hour. You know what Jesus says to people about the 11th hour? You also go and work in my vineyard. 
But it doesn't really matter the age, of course. What matters is the response, the obedience, and whether you are 18 or 24, whether you've been to college or not. Abraham responds and he goes, and he symbolically goes from the top of the country to the bottom, symbolically claiming the land for God, for it is not yet fully conquered. It is not God's land yet, but he's symbolically claiming it, this land, this blessing, the meek shall inherit the earth, the new kingdom, the new, the new heaven, the new earth that will be fulfilled in Christ. He's symbolically claiming that in these very early days as he goes from the top of the country all the way down to the Negev, close to Egypt. And do you notice what he does as he goes? He worships. I was a young man that uh, was under my care for a while. And he went off to India to do some mission work. And he was an exuberant young guy. In fact, he liked uh, monocycling, you know, not two wheels, just one wheel. He loved doing that. And he used to monocycle down the mountains in India. I mean, he was quite a guy. We got the call, I think it was one, I think it was midweek. He'd uh, fallen off uh, the mountain, basically. And so, of course, I rushed over to be with the family while I was sitting in the living room. This is, you know, their 18, 19 year old son, and he's in India. Can you imagine being the mother and thinking, I, I, I just want to do something? Like, you're just sitting there waiting. And they got news he'd been airlifted to hospital. Actually, it's a remarkable story. He is indeed paralyzed, and for many years he went around sharing the gospel from a wheelchair. It was actually a huge victory. Everything works out for the best for those who trust God. If very counterintuitive. And do you know what? When Rochelle and I turned up at that house with the father and the mother, experienced Yale professor, evangelical Christian and the mother, godly woman and their family gathered in their living room. Do you know what they were doing? They had another son on a guitar and they were worshiping. So did Abraham. Would you then this morning make a commitment as you go through this land as a pilgrim on your journey to the new heaven and the new earth, would you make a commitment to as you go build an altar of worship, to read the Bible, to pray, to do it each day? to build God's kingdom through church planting, to build these altars of worship through the land as we advance the kingdom. Well, let's do that this morning. Let's uh, stand to sing. We're gonna sing, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart, Thou Mine Inheritance, Now and Always, Thou and Thou Only, First in My Heart, High King of Heaven, My Treasure Thou Art. Let's stand.